Good morning and have a good day, dear ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you all back for the second day of the 46 ATFIAP annual meetings. Today we have a very dynamic program planned with panel discussions, networking and of course ATFIAP awards night. Thus, let's begin with the presentation of the Green Agenda Report to be delivered by our first speaker of today, Eurasian Development Bank Managing Director, Head of the Directorate of Sustainability, Mr. Konrad Albrecht. Please welcome on our stage with a round of applause. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here and very happy to be starting the day uh, with this presentation of our Green Agenda in the Eurasian region. Here we have the slide, okay. Um, I would first like to start um, to saying that this is the very first, um, uh, you know, presentation and report that we started with our Center of Integration Studies of our Research Directorate in conjunction with our Department on the Green Standards. In this report uh, for the Eurasian region, we investigated the current state and the future prospects of the Green Agenda in, in the region, Eurasia, uh, with a focus on climate change issues and on the role of development institutions for the transition um, on a low carbon and more resilient economy that we are looking to achieve in the next few years. And this report marks the beginning of the series of the sustainability-related studies that we are planning to do more and more in the future. As we aim to move deeper in the thematic research and we very welcome other development banks and stakeholders to join us for joint research opportunities. Central Asia is very specifically vulnerable uh, to physical and climate risks due to the water deficiency, water stress, and risks that is abated part of this region. According to some estimates, by 2050, the volume of water in the basins of Sir Daria and Amu Daria, as you can see on the right side of the slide, um, the two largest sources of the water in the region, which are located in the south of Kazakhstan and also in the south border of Uzbekistan with Turkmenistan, may decrease by the rate of 10 to 15%. Limited availability of water will inevitably affect the region agricultural sector, which is, uses water as the most critical inputs, as we know, for the production of food and food products. The decrease of wheat production in sovereign regions of Kazakhstan could cause even an economic loss of more than $1.2 billion by 2030, the year of the SDG agenda. We also have transition climate risks that also pose a threat to the region and in specifically for the dependency from fossil fuels that we know in the region, the countries that are very dependent upon for the large share of exports. The demand of conventional energy resources will be gradually reduced by the global carbon policies. Since the climate-related regulation in the region is still rather weak when compared to uh, developed markets, the exporters will also be affected by carbon border adjustment mechanisms, and for even considering Russian companies may face additional costs of up to $14.7 billion per year given the taxes. According to the new sanction, and this number is also estimated on um, from the uh, adjusted estimates from the sanctions base. And although in Kazakhstan is the only country in the Eurasian region uh, that has a very strong carbon pricing in place in the form of the emissions trading scheme, the EU carbon border tax burden on the deer exports for the country could also reach $250 million per year. So it's also very important to stress that the transition climate, both in conjunction, they are very interlinked over the long term and should be analyzed side by side. The sooner that those countries of the region, they can intensify 
um, their decarbonization efforts, we can see that the lower the potential for the transition the physical risks could be associated with the costs and the exposure to stranded assets will be. And in other, in the other hand, delayed transition will also can signify a very important risk for future increases on natural disasters, cause of the melting of the permafrost, as we know, the rising of the global sea levels, and all the other effects that can be irreversible, as we know, and even despite the reduction of the greenhouse gases emissions. Now, this, is like, uh, this slide is very interesting as we can see the profile of the main countries of Central Asia uh, and Eurasia in general. In general, the, the volume of the region's uh, emissions is very significantly exceeds the weight in the global economy. As you can see, both comparing GDP uh, and the population um, for the region countries, and specifically some of them like Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, the share in the global CO2 emissions, as you can see there as uh, the blue line, is less than the global population the cumulative data also demonstrates uh, the critical carbon intensity of the region. Now we can see even more detail uh, per capita in the region and the average uh, exceeded the global average emissions for each country. Uh, and the situation is also uh, not inspiring as well, but it also means it can be interpreted as a potential avenue of business opportunities in the field of green finance. The majority of those countries that we have here, they have uh, exceeded the global average, as you can see on the orange dashed in the middle of the graph, uh, or the average from the countries with comparable income levels, which is also defined by the World Bank. Kazakhstan and Russia have the highest emissions per capita in the region and mostly do the coal fire generation um, as is like inherently uh, part of the industries and the country matrix uh, and also not just on energy but also on oil and gas sector. On the other hand, we have Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, the lowest CO2 emissions per capita, even lower than the average for countries with below average uh, income do the largest share and those countries have a very good advantage on the hydroelectric power on their energy matrix. Now, those seem very beneficial at the first side. I also wanted to mention that those conditions are specifically as well vulnerable to the physical climate risks that those countries are also be facing in the next few years. On this slide, we can also see the structure of the GHG emission sources on the region. We will define here five major, that we can say, painful points, with the energy sector being the largest one, as you can see in the blue line, and contributing to the almost half of the overall amount of the emissions. Industrial emissions are also very significant in Tajikistan and Russia, transport emissions in Armenia and Belarus, emissions from the agricultural industry in Kyrgyzstan and in Tajikistan. So if we consider this as an opportunity side or an opportunistic view, we can also clearly identify that here, the key five sectors where internationally and cross-boundary transition finance can play a very important role and the most maybe crucial role, both for business deals, opportunities for origination, but also for that we can move forward with the NDCs and the Paris Agreement objectives of those countries. And here we can also see a disclose basically on how actually we also see on the other side of the coin a better uh, news on the horizon, if we can say like that. All the countries in the region, they have extremely serious being committed with climate change, um, as we can see the contribution on the global agenda. And they're very ready to assume their decarbonization, very ambition of decarbonization um, commitments. As we see here, all those countries, they have set GAG emissions reduction targets in the first column uh, in, the gray in the green area. 
uh, targets reductions by 2030 when compared to 1990. And the majority have also set a carbon neutrality target for the economy. And this really demonstrates in the middle of the, the table the emissions from 2020 compared to 1990 that it actually decreased from the previous levels and what they set as the targets up to 2030. So we see progress. Um, and this is also a very positive trend for the last 20 years. But there is no doubt that others will also need to catch up. And the reality is that climate science and ESG data in the region, and this is very important to highlight, is very and highly scarce and hardly available across uh, all those countries. And of course, this is not the only situation that we see here, but even talking about the smaller economies and even emerging and frontier markets, but overall, we can state that the main painful points for this data scarcity is that there is very incipient characteristic of the capital markets in this region. We have a handful of publicly listed companies, illiquidity issues, secondary equity and bond markets that are also basically dominated by the institutional local investors. And those markets can be not so attractive for foreign capital in the first sight. Um, not even maybe easily accessible for those investors that they have this potential for raising up investments in the region. So one of the key deterministic factors also for the ESG or sustainability data scarcity is also the markets are not yet still developed and we don't have the large big companies also being available for trading and the equities on the bond side for international investors. On the other hand, we also have a second point, which is very important to highlight. As a consequence, across the region, you can imagine if we don't have large corporations being available to publicly disclose and engage more with sustainability data being available for the institutional investors, how can we expect this going forward for smaller uh, enterprises, SMEs? So it's even more scarce in that to what we can expect for even for projects based on those smaller companies. So in general, Companies on all odd sizes, they do know and see how sustainable, how they can see that how sustainability and integration in the business models and across the organization structure can become like a magnifier effect, better for risk management practices and even for the discovery of new business streams, for green deal services, product solutions that we can expect and will be much more demanded by the next few years to come. So as we progress towards a low carbon and more resilient uh, economy by 2030 and 2050. In the end, as a competitive advantage that those companies they also need to see, and this is where the key sector on the financiers, so on the banks and institutional investors, they can really play and chime in for raising up the standards and also as this a winning play field to be enacted. The awareness is the first problem solving. So we need to raise the awareness for companies and institutional investors. We have this characteristic of the region, but also we, all, we need to see the solutions set. And we can clearly see that the Eurasian states, they also demonstrate some progress, although all those challenges that we have in the region. This year, the Eurasian Economic Commission has proposed a model, a regional taxonomy for labeling products of green projects that will accelerate the transition towards a very low carbon economy and provide common ground for all the other countries, not just be relying on Russia and Kazakhstan with their own national taxonomies, but across the board on the integrated phase in Eurasia, inspiring other smaller economies and smaller countries to do the same that they can really expedite this agenda for projects aligned with the taxonomies. And the most intensive or carbon intensive uh, sectors in the economy, they have specific low carbon solutions for that, right? Although the main impact can be achieved by unlocking the potential of the clean energy for the future growth. So this specific uh, industry is really a key that we can see here in green energy, but also transport, industry, urban development, and agriculture. 
the base bond or let's say the backbone of the industries in the region that really need to be impaired by a taxonomy that now we have in Eurasia. Nevertheless, we can also state very importantly that this uh, last year we have an inflection point uh, across the market. Um, decarbonization is, um, as we know, a very intensive process and it will basically require from at least $10 billion in Kazakhstan to up to $6.5 trillion in Russia to achieve their carbon neutrality targets. And as we see in this graph, the last year, we, as I was saying, we saw this inflection point, a very important signal of the market that climate finance has finally uh, and now the investments in the energy transition equaled the annual cost of the fossil fuel production uh, for the very first time that last year. So we really crossed the mark. So this is a very emblematic point for the future. Even as we have been seeing a significant market turbulence in the last year, the issue is dropping, but also green uh, bonds demonstrated a very high resilience um, and the lowest reduction against um, the investor appetite continue to proceed for demanding greening solutions for their investment portfolios, although all the challenges that we've seen, we have seen in the last year. Um, well, the downside, I will also highlight that this is, or a point for attention, is that these annual capital flows are still insufficient for the global carbon decarbonization and need at least more to be 4.5 times higher than that we have been seeing so far, so that we can really reach safely or very comfortably the carbon neutral trajectory. So the need for climate related investment is very specifically high, uh, in, in particular in this region, like we see the average and below average income countries. We can also zoom in now for our partners like the Eurasian Development Bank and all the other DFIs and MDBs as the global financiers take in action, um, how those multilateral development institutions uh, have a very critical role for funding uh, the role of climate finance. As you can see here in this graph, with key disimbursements uh, of some few players, not all, but some of the key players um, in, in the region as well, that have presence not just uh, uh, in Eurasia but across the globe. From 19, 2019 to 2021, we see this growing momentum, even though we saw a um, decline uh, in 2020, but also we can see a wrap up on 2021. But it's also not restricted to financing. It's also important to highlight that all the disimbursements, those financiers, they really play a key role for moving with the agenda, but we also have to highlight and remember that MDBs, the development institutions, they also are very uniquely experienced for capacity building and also for the technical system that can provide for projects, structuring those projects throughout the project cycle and the assessment for climate risks and opportunities for the companies that really need the support. So it's not just the financial component. Green infrastructure products, um, they produce significant environmental and social impacts, but often, as we see on the return on investments, private investors will also see higher risks and maybe some lower yields. So this is also where MDBs can also encourage private investors to invest in green projects by mitigating those risks, providing this technical capacity, subsidizing or offering guarantees for the production and the reduction of facilitating the expansion of those projects, even through syndicalization. So it is anticipated that the climate finance projects will also continue to dominate the MDB portfolios. And one of the key takeaways from COP27, and I was very glad as well when the Eurasian Development Bank to participate last year, is that the call to align the global financial architecture with the climate goals, and in specific, 
the adjustments for uh, the mandates of the and the bees and the institutional financial institutions that were formalized to maximize investment in the energy transition and the climate change adaptation projects. As we can also see uh, here uh, on the left side of the table, uh, the MDBs already ramp up on the amounts of climate financing in the developing countries, including in Eurasia, from 2021, 62% of that less, you can see the higher um, uh, column here, 21, we can see, and even in the 2022, um, the 62% of that amount was channeled for low and middle income countries for the climate mitigation and adaptation projects as well. So this is also very important to see this scaling up process for targeting frontier and emerging markets. Here's just another example of how those uh, selected um, institutions, they also are channeling in their finance to Eurasia. Um, very critically important, the majority of them, they have specific climate finance or green project targets. Um, and this slide basically lists a few of those prominent names, but it's not an exhaustive or exclusionary list. Um, we see some of those banks really playing in uh, their contributions for uh, Eurasia. Even though, as we can see on the right side hand of the slide, the share in the Central Asia in the total finance provided by those MDBs and the um, development institutions in general provided basically in 2021 a share of 4% in the total financing that they can provide, which I assume to be low or relatively low when compared to the amounts directed to other low and middle income countries. So this is also an opportunity for seeing what can be unchanneled or unlocked for new opportunities in this specific region. And in 2022, the Eurasian Development Bank made a quantum jump in the area of sustainable development. We also have uh, integrated testing of all the sustainability-related processes of our organization assess the current level of the implementation of the global ESG standards in our very own operations, a fully, completely revamp, revealed all of our internal documents and our procedures, and we also identified the gaps and opportunities for improvement, um, and also explored the global best practices of our own peers and all those global MDBs and all partners even uh, that are outside of the Eurasian region. At the end of the last year, the work culminated with the first sustainability um, development strategy for the bank for 22 and 26, where we stated the ambition to become the number one sustainability institution in the region. And we plan to expand our green project portfolio, in particular to the implementation of large-scale projects, such as the Eurasian Transport Network, the Eurasian Distribution Network, and the Central Asia Water and Energy Complex, the Nexus, among very other important infrastructure projects that we have for the next few years to come. And closing remarks, I would really uh, hope that this report of the Global Agenda is also available already online. And as we see after the, um, this event, we can also see hard copy printed ready for your uh, interest and also one slide page, an eco-friendly one that you can also use um, the barcode to access and also download directly on a PDF. But I think that um, thinking about the, how the region will develop the climate risks and opportunities that we need to size in, including the business um, and financing opportunities ones, um, with a fresh new eye, I think we all have to see that Eurasia, the ambition and the interest for this report is that this is a very vulnerable and very sensitive uh, region of the planet, specifically for climate changes issues. But also, the region is really taking up, is really making significant efforts to build the critical infrastructure necessary and all the backbone mechanisms that are needed 
for transitioning with resilience to a low carbon economy and all the conditions to raise up this attractiveness for institutional investors, private capital from international markets to carry on more green projects that are desperately needed in this region going forward more and more. And we really need to emphasize for all the financial players going forward, and especially for development institutions, development banks in particular. It's in our hands to make the region more attractive, more accessible, and even more interesting for the private capital. So this is a call for action. And this is where our bank can be considered a very trustful partner of choice. Um, the key differentiators that we have to support this transition in the region is our regional experience and focus uh, driver for executing projects that have a very high technical capacity, having a first-hand connectivity with the governing institutions and also agents in the market, understanding very the inner details and the real challenges that is faced in this region, also to unlock the challenges that we have here, what is behind there, the opportunities for each individual country and the cross-boundary effects of the infrastructure needs, the climate and sustainability infrastructure needs that we have in the region, and specifically for project finance. As we have this regional focus, it is our also responsibility and advantage to carry on the financing of smaller to mid projects as well, including their execution. So we as a middle-sized institution, we can also partner with the global development banks. So we have this complementary effect with smaller, medium, and also complex, large projects, all in conjunction, co-financing, finding new funding sources as well, but also building up this technical capacity for the projects to be unveiled in the region. So, and I really call this for uh, a call for action, and we're very much looking forward to expand the partnerships that we can have and unlock in this region across all the private and public sectors, across here in Eurasia, but also internationally from our partners that are interested more and more in this very, very ambitional uh, targets that we have to deliver for the region, but also very good opportunities on the horizon as the most maybe accelerated growth opportunities for economic development is relying here in Eurasia. So I thank you very much for your attention and for having this opportunity to know more, a bit more about the characteristics of the Eurasian countries, the challenges that we have, and specifically the opportunities that we can unlock together as the global financiers, the regional and the local institutions that can play out the projects for this region. Thank you very much and enjoy the day. Thank you so much, Mr. Albrecht. We appreciate you for your presentation and so informative speech. Thank you so much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, in one minute, we will continue our presentation. are a distinctive phenomenon of the modern banking system and their role in the global economy and influence on society continue to grow constantly. Business solutions that are based not on commercial interests but on the principles of good faith and reasonableness and aimed at the sustainable environmental and social development of regions and improving people's lives have proved effective at different levels. The Association of Development Financing Institutions in Asia and the Pacific consists of 90 organizations from 40 countries. In over 50 years of active and successful operations, the association has become the world's largest alliance of national and regional development institutions. 
The projects financed by ADFIAF organizations actively influence the continuous development of huge territories that account for as much as 35% of the surface of our planet and the home to some 2 billion people. The active investment approach of ADFIAP members is crucial for communications between governments and the private sector and is successful in developing the financial, human and intellectual capital of our countries. The joint work carried out under the auspices of the association not only helps to increase the influence on the global financial architecture, but is also crucial for developing national and cross-border infrastructure, green innovation and inclusive growth projects, raising energy efficiency, supporting small and medium-sized businesses, agriculture, ensuring sustainable economic growth and higher living standards. We believe that continuous development and innovations are the most important instruments for global improvement and that our partnership helps unite the world around projects that are truly important. Association of Development Financing Institutions in Asia and the Pacific. We make this world better together. Thank you to your guests for attention. Now we continue with the next panel discussion. Please welcome on stage the session moderator, member of the Board of Directors, Development Bank of Kazakhstan, Mr. Anwar Saidianov. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, I think it's a very interesting topic of our session and the panel which is overcrowded, uh, I must say, is very impressive. I wish there was th this line of investors to Kazakhstan. Uh, should I announce everybody or will there will be an announcement? Okay. I would like to invite uh, Ardak Zibeshev, who is chairman of investment committee. Yernur Rismagambetov, chairman of the board, Astana International Financial Center. Alia Yezdaulietova, Director of Investment Policy Department, Ministry of National Economy. Kalenbek Abdekadyrov, Deputy Mayor, Almaty City. Marat Gilibayev, Deputy Chairman, Development Bank of Kazakhstan. Ruslan Dalyanov, Deputy Chairman, Eurasian Development Bank. Jens Algren Hesbeck, Senior Vice President, Denmark's Export and Investment Fund. Uh, 
Галымбек Мамраев, CEO YDA Holding. And Durav Jandosov, co-founder, Universal Energy Kazakhstan. I think with such an impressive panel, it's better to give a word to them, and my introductory remarks will be quite short. I think investment's effect on uh, the society in general is manifold. Of course, for owners of this project, it's a commercial interest. For the region or for the country in general, it's creation of jobs, taxes. For the economy, it's introduction of new progressive uh, technologies. Nowadays, of course, it's uh, green principles. But I must say, from the financial point of view, getting funds for such projects is not an easy task. For example, if you look at uh, commercial banks here in Kazakhstan, they are not interested and very often they are not in the position to finance this project because there is a gap of the funds they could attract and the terms on which they could lend uh, to, to, uh, to the projects. That's why the role of the state development institutions is critical in that respect. And I hope our speakers today could uh, share their experience in uh, implementing such projects. The representatives of the state and financial institutions could indicate what possibilities are uh, possible and what hampers the investment in Kazakhstan. The first speaker is Ardak Zabeshev, Investment Committee Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. So, uh, dear participants and the ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome all participants and guests of the 46th meeting of Association of Development Financing Institutions in Asia and Pacific. And first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for the excellent organization and conduct of this event, as well as uh, our esteemed speakers who will be sharing their views and knowledge and ideas. Kazakhstan is the largest economy in Central Asia and we pay special attention to improving the investment climate and uh, to create most favorable conditions for investors. The main indicator of the country's and the region's attractiveness for business is the inflow of uh, foreign direct investment. And uh, I can say that over the years of independence, Kazakhstan has attracted more than 410 billion US dollars. And in 2022, this growth inflow was even uh, a record for the last 10 years, and we attracted 28 billion US dollars. So the largest countries by FDI is, as usual, Netherlands, US, Switzerland, Russia, China, Great Britain, Belgium, South Korea, Japan, and Italy, and France. Uh, our president <coughs> set a task for the government to attract at least 150 billion US dollars during the next seven years. So accordingly, we have a plan to attract at least 24 billion US dollars annually. And last year, we launched 46 investment projects, which is worth more than 4 billion US dollars, and that created 6,500 jobs. Our country also ranks six in the world of, in terms of natural reserves and tens in terms of overall volume of non-oil and gas mineral extraction. These are very impressive numbers, and among, among the indicators, we can also highlight the dynamics of the gross domestic product. So if we consider Kazakhstan's aggregate GDP, it amounted to 
220.5 billion US dollars in 2022. And the average annual GDP growth rate over the past six years has been 4.3%, while the global average stands at 2.6%. Kazakhstan also is a leader in terms of foreign trade turnover within 60% of all Central Asian imports and exports passing through our territory. In 2022, this uh, uh, turnover reached even also a record and it was 34 billion US dollars. Furthermore, uh, I can say the international agencies continue to maintain high investment ratings for Kazakhstan and these indicators are based on the measures that are taken by government to improve the investment climate and ensure economic stability in the country. Many multinational companies have already chosen Kazakhstan for expanding their presence here and already 50,000 companies with foreign participation already are operating in Kazakhstan. So we are taking concrete steps towards prioritizing comprehensive support for investors. These measures will be um, set by my colleague from Ministry of National Economy, I believe. And I can say that thanks to our also geographical location, Kazakhstan serves as a key link in the great Silk Road connecting Europe and Asia. And since gaining independence, the country's strategic initiatives have been focused on the qualitative diversification of our economy, technological modernization of key industries, and the development of human capital. Kazakhstan possesses three factors of attractiveness. It's a diversified energy sector, logistics, and significant natural resources. So we have significant potential for the production of subsequent export of green energy. Furthermore, our country role as a transit country for cargo deliveries from uh, Asia to Europe, and it is now even increasing. And given the disruption of supply chains and the rise of food prices worldwide, ensuring food security, which is directly related to the development of agriculture, has become more relevant than ever and the agro-industrial industries plays the role in Kazakhstan's economy and has significant investment potential. Our climate allows to cultivate almost all temperate climate crops and the development of livestock farming. In many positions, Kazakhstan has the potential to become one of the world's largest producers of agricultural products, including environmentally friendly food. To achieve this, the government actively develops and invests in raw material processing in agriculture. In accordance with the instructions of the president uh, last year during the expanded government meeting, uh, government uh, investment committee uh, con produced, so we uh, formed an investment pipeline that has uh, announced and currently this pipeline consists of 873 projects that worth about 28 trillion tenge and it is expected to create around 140,000 jobs in Kazakhstan. So for the moment I wanted to share that Ministry of Foreign Affairs is working on creation a unified investment platform. This platform envisions to the establishment of an information system for comprehensive support of investors and investment projects. And it will integrate all participants of the investment attraction system. It's a government agencies, quasi-public entities, financial institutions, investors, and uh, others. So in 2022, within the framework of the knowledge and experience exchange program between government of Kazakhstan and Asian Development Bank, 
analytical research was conducted by ADB experts. So our friends from ADB recommended the creation of a new investment platform as the existing ones didn't meet all necessary criteria. And after receiving the assessment from ADB consultants <coughs> regarding the budget for creating this platform, Minister of Foreign Affairs, in collaboration with the Ministry of Finance and the Eurasian Development Bank, held negotiations to obtain technical assistance. And as a result of these negotiations, the Eurasian Development Bank provisionally confirmed financing for this project. And I would like to take this opportunity and express my gratitude to Asian Development Bank and the Eurasian Development Bank for their support on this project and in general for supporting all initiatives in Kazakhstan which is related to investors. I hope that this event and discussion will provide you with a better understanding of the benefits of Kazakhstan and the opportunities that exist for business and investors. For our part, as an investment committee, we are ready to provide with all necessary support at any level. Thank you for your attention and I will look forward for continuing the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to make a historical remark. Uh, this type of agencies or institutions were established from the beginning of Kazakhstan. They were named differently. Uh, but Mr. Jandosov, who is present here, was the head of the first national agency on foreign investment, which was under the Ministry of Economy. And actually, he signed the license number one for foreign investor, which was Philip Morris, which purchased Almaty Tobacco Factory back in 1992, yes? Or something like that. So, uh, uh, Mr. Zabeshev, I have uh, uh, this question. Of course, nowadays the uh, geopolitical environment is quite uh, difficult, troublesome. What uh, uh, challenges do you think the committee faces at the moment? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I can say that any, uh, as you may uh, agree with me, so any uh, difficulties and challenges create uh, new opportunities. So for the current time, yes, we have difficulties, but at the same time we have uh, uh, many companies who are looking for localization here in the region, especially in Kazakhstan. And uh, by saying that, I can uh, give uh, the information that more than 60 companies are on a, a real negotiation on uh, localization uh, here in Kazakhstan. They are um, producing entities and uh, more than 400 companies are in our list, so we <coughs> are working through our embassies and through our uh, local administrations how to localize and relocate these companies uh, to Kazakhstan. And uh, even looking at uh, those numbers from the last year, we can see that it's a 18% increase in FDI, in a gross FDI, but when we look net, it's also increasing, which shows that there are many new entities uh, establishing here. Uh, net FDI last year was amount at 6.1 billion US dollars, which is also the last figure like that was in 2016. So which shows that we have some opportunities and we are creating new instruments, uh, investment agreement, uh, agreement on investment obligations for mining companies. So working how to make our investment climate more favorable and more stable. Thank you. Thank you. I fully agree with you. It should be a time of opportunities. Uh, uh, let's politicians do their work and 
financiers and <laughs> investment officers there. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yernur Rismambetov, chairman of the board at Sana International Financial Center. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Saidenov. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Yerner. I'm the CEO of AFC Authority. Uh, we have prepared a slide for you, but I will be uh, probably, uh, because we, have, we, we don't have much time, I'll just wanted to structure my speech into three parts. First, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Astana International Financial Center. Second, I wanted to share with you some of the cases we have done with uh, development finance institutions. And uh, third, maybe propose some of the ways how we can uh, collaborate uh, going forward. So uh, Astana International Financial Center is an integrated regional financial center investment hub located on the left bank of Astana. So the way it's structured is very similar to other financial centers like DIFC in Dubai, QFC in Doha, Qatar, uh, ADGM Abu Dhabi, and uh, we were very much inspired by studying different cases like uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, London, and uh, uh, other financial centers as well. So the way we are structured, we are structured as an independent jurisdiction uh, based on the English common law. And uh, we have our own AAFC Act, which dictates and regulates business practices within uh, AAFC. Let me see if the clicker is working. So the way uh, we are governed is we have the management council chaired by the president and we have uh, different uh, members of the cabinet of the government of Kazakhstan, uh, central bank, Ag agency for financial uh, regulation, ministry of foreign affairs, as well as some of the international experts. You may recognize Sir Suma Chakrabarty, who used to be the president of EBRD, maybe Jacob Frankel, who used to be the C CEO of JP Morgan International, and Julia Monaco, who, is, who leads government initiatives for the Citibank. So, so the way we are structured, we have the management council that governs uh, uh, our entire ecosystem. We have the governor of AFC, who, uh, uh, who adopts the acts of AFC, and we have four bodies: AFC Authority, which is the main coordinating body of our ecosystem; AFSA, Astana Financial Service Authority, which is a financial and corporate regulator of our ecosystem. And we also have independent court and independent arbitration center, which work independently from the court system of Kazakhstan. And they are used for the dispute, uh, they act as a dispute resolution authorities in our ecosystem. But we also have some of the organizations which we use for the development of the markets, which I'll come to you a little bit later. So uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have adopted in 2016 and 17. We spent actually two years on building up a jurisdiction of AAFC. We had to adopt a constitutional act on AAFC, which governs the entire ecosystem of AAFC. As I mentioned, we have a separate court and independent arbitration center. Just to give you some numbers, we have nine judges who actually give out all these decisions of the court. They are, they are all international and reputable judges. So over the past five years, we have launched in 2018, we've had close to 2,000 cases. Uh, some of them are actually court decisions, but most of them are arbitration and uh, mediation de decisions. And all of these decisions have been enforced 100% up to date. With regards to our uh, regulator, so we have our own independent regulator, which adopts AAFC acts and AAFC regulations. So the AAFC regulator, AFSA, actually grants and authorizes uh, and issues licenses to companies to conduct certain parts of financial activities within AAFC and from AAFC to the region as well. And just to mention you about a few projects, so we have, over the past five years, we have built two platforms. One of the platforms we have built is called uh, AIX, Astana International Exchange. This was the project jointly uh, started with the EBRD, a European uh, Bank of Reconstruction and Development, and their capital markets team actually was very instrumental in helping us to set this up. So in 2018, we launched a new uh, exchange uh, together with, uh, jointly with other partners, with the NASDAQ and Shanghai Stock Exchange, which are the, one of the top five leaders in the, capital, uh, in the stock uh, exchanges. And we also have other investors, such as Goldman Sachs and Silk Road Fund. So you can see on the left side, there are some products that we can do. We can pretty much do any product that any exchanges has. And just to give you some numbers, uh, over the past five years, we were able to attract 
2.7 uh, billion US dollars through our exchange. Uh, these are just some of the IPOs and the SPOs and listings uh, that we have conducted over the past five years. Next, we have also built a private investment platform. And here uh, we have uh, created different types of structures, such as funds, uh, special companies, special purpose companies, uh, and etc. So we have around 20 different types of companies you can set up in AFC. And uh, nowadays there are close to 2,000 companies which are registered from 73 countries uh, all over the world. And most of them, they conduct different types of businesses. Around 300 of them conduct financial services, but others are uh, special vehicles that are s set up to invest into Kazakhstan and the region as well. So this is just to show you our uh, network that we have built up over the past five years. We pretty much uh, interact and collaborate with uh, most of the development institutions from east to west, from south to north. And uh, with this, I wanted to give you some of the cases that we have done over the past years. These are just our numbers. Maybe I can switch to next. So one of the issues that, that we are doing with the Islamic Development Bank, we are trying to build Islamic uh, finance business and hub. So we have adopted uh, separate uh, rules within AFC that allows Islamic finance companies to operate, exist, and uh, uh, conduct their businesses from AFC. And as, as of now, we have around 30 to 40 Islamic finance companies this is pretty early stage, but we, have, we are seeing rapid development of this industry, and uh, we really think going forward, this type of financing will be very popular, not just in Kazakhstan, but in the entire Central Asian region. Another project we have uh, launched is actually a separate subsidiary with the Eurasian Development Bank. It's called the Center for Green Finance. So we started with adopting a green taxonomy for the government. Then we, we were the first ones to issue green bonds. And after that, over the past two, three years, we have tried to issue different types of in uh, instruments uh, from green loans, green credit. Last year, we'll, we launched social bonds. And also, last year, we have issued the first gender bond in Central Asia in the Kyrgyz Republic. So our job here is to actually populate the market with different types of products that investors and the issuers can use. And uh, one of the projects that we are working on, uh, st started to work on this year, is the carbon platform. So we're starting to think how the carbon market could operate uh, on the basis of AAC. Uh, we have also established a national ESG club, which includes almost all of the major uh, financial entities and the industry uh, companies. We have around 70 companies, and all of them have their own ESG agenda. And we collaborate on a quarterly basis on how to actually develop ESG agenda uh, in Kazakhstan. So the third initiative we have launched with the World Economic Forum. Uh, we have uh, launched a center for fourth industrial revolution. So th this center actually uh, helps companies all over the world to bring technology to the country, to adapt them, and to launch them. One of the cases we have done is a company called OneWeb, which launches satellites, uh, which uh, uh, is trying to launch an internet based on satellite orbiting. So uh, actually, we have helped them from the start to the end to get registered and to actually launch this project in Kazakhstan. So this is just a brief overview of AAFC and some of the things we have done. And we'll be very happy to collaborate with any development institutions, with any investor, with any project. So uh, we can work as a partner, we can work as a collaborator, and we could be actually also a perfect place to start or launch initiative. One of the things that we have done last year, for, for example, is a gender gap accelerator. It was a great initiative, but they didn't know uh, where to launch. So over the past two years, we were able to launch and we were able to finance uh, SME entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs from southern Kazakhstan. So we acted as a partner in that initiative. And uh, we could be also your partner in any other initiatives that you would like to launch in Kazakhstan. Thank you very much. I'll stop here and I'll be very happy to answer any questions now or during the, uh, after the panel session. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very detailed description of the structure and activities of Almaty International Financial Center. Uh, I will have the question. Uh, um, do you have plans for introducing new financial instruments which could secure the sustainable growth in Kazakhstan and in the region as a whole? 
Uh, thank you very much for the question. So, uh, in terms of new products, so we are trying to, as of now, to bring all the global products that exist in the global markets to actually make it available in Kazakhstan through AFC. That's our job that we have been working on over the past five years. But going forward, we see this big trend of actually financial products are being coupled with technology. So we have uh, established a separate uh, sandbox called FinTech Lab where you can launch uh, any product uh, on a testing mode. So one of the uh, products uh, that we have been working on over the past years is uh, securitization and tokenization. So that have been in a big demand. Uh, platforms like crowdfunding and other types of uh, financial uh, instruments related to technology. But besides that, uh, what we are trying to promote is ESG, not just as an environment, but also as a social and governance. Most people often forget that ESG is not just about planet. Of course, planet is the most important thing. But we believe uh, that in Kazakhstan and the region, the social aspect would be critical, especially uh, if you look at the recent years and recent trends. So things like uh, gender bonds or, or financing SMEs or financing entrepreneurs is actually as important as also uh, caring about the planet. And also the governance. So the governance has been, the, I would say, the maybe the one of the gaps that people always tend to forget when implementing new instruments. So social and governance is the two areas that we are focus on, uh, focusing on without forgetting about environment, about green bonds, green loans, and etc. I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to give floor to Alia Yezdaulietova, Director of Investment uh, Policy Department, Ministry of National Economy. Please. Thank you very much. Good day, participants of the investment session. I am happy to welcome you all at this event. I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers, to the Eurasian Bank, Development Bank, for invitation and opportunity to talk about investment climate in Kazakhstan. Today we have a sound regulatory legal base in Kazakhstan and favorable conditions for the investment activities which promotes direct foreign investments in last year in a big amount that was the highest indicator in the last 10 years. Excuse me, I forgot to switch the slides. Adherence of Kazakhstan to the global investment standards uh, promotes its recognition by foreign investors as a reliable law being economic partner which evidences which is evidenced by the stable high ratings from the international rating agencies there are all classical tools functioning in Kazakhstan to attract investments uh, used globally for the investment attractiveness of the country the following conditions have been created simplified procedures for opening and conducting business like online registration of any business using e-government KZ, e-gov KZ as an investment preference. The companies working in the priority sectors of economy are released from taxes, duties, natural grants, investment credits and loans, simplified permissions to work. According to the global advanced practices, there are 11 special economic zones in Kazakhstan and 33 industrial zones which provide a developed infrastructure and a wide range of investment uh, incentives. I'd like to focus on separate mechanisms which allow the investors to have a comfortable working condition here in Kazakhstan and feel protection in implementation of the investment projects. For large businesses of investors, legally, an agreement can be concluded with the government relating to investments. Uh, this mechanism is used to attract private investment into large investment projects. The investor is obligated to invest funds and then implement this project, and the government is obligated to help this investor in two areas. Number one, the government can provide any assistance within the 
current legislation. Agreements can be signed on individualized terms and conditions. And uh, number two, uh, legal conditions can be adjusted. When such investor enters into this agreement, they will be guaranteed that the legislation will not be sort of changed or amended. What kind of companies can sign such agreements? Any legal entity that is registered in Kazakhstan with the investment volume not less than $50 million. To simplify the process of entering into investment agreements, last year amendments were made to the Entrepreneurial Code uh, so that everything is made simpler and uh, we have this list of priority uh, types of activity and in light of that agreements cannot be signed uh, relating to gambling etc for this uh, the sectoral competent agency will be responsible. Assistance will be provided to investors by Kazakh Invest uh, with the help of single window approach. Uh, this amendment was implemented under Mr. Dalyanov when he was the Minister of National Economy. And I would like to sort of draw your attention to that. He's uh, one of uh, the speakers today. Also, uh, legislation of Kazakhstan stipulates uh, that agreements uh, on obligations can be signed, whereby stability of tax legislation can be guaranteed for 10 years of, for producers of goods. The investor, in his turn, is obligated to invest significant amounts of funds into launching or upgrading production, training of uh, Kazakhstani employees. To attract investment into mining, from this year, fiscal stimuli were introduced when a model contract is signed, under this contract it is envisaged that any disputes that will arise can be settled in an arbitration court that can be chosen by the subsoil users and this court can be located inside the country or at um, AIIC. Uh, to enhance PPP mechanism last year, amendments were made to relevant laws. Now all projects uh, go through uh, competition procedures. Uh, this will ensure the balance of interest between the government and the business community to enhance transparency and accountability together with EBD, a portal will be launched to make sure that projects on uh, PPP are implemented properly. This will be done this year. As for AIFC, I will not dwell on this one because my colleague has already told you about AIFC. To further improve the investment climate, in July last year, a new concept of the investment policy was approved until 2026. It will allow to launch a new investment cycle and to review the investment policy in light of new trends, including ESG standards. Uh, to improve the business climate, we have a visa-free regime with 76 countries. The government of Kazakhstan supports an active dialogue with investors through the Council of Foreign Investors under the President and through the uh, Investment Committee under the Prime Minister to resolve problems, current problems. Uh, there is the Investment Ombudsman Institute under the Prime Minister to promote standards of responsible business in Kazakhstan under the Ministry of Economy. Uh, there is a national contact center. 
further work focuses on resolving of problems. We hope that these reforms will enable us to attract, to enhance the investment competitiveness of our country globally. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Olya, for such a detailed presentation of all preferences that can maybe attract foreign investors to Kazakhstan. So you have told us about the 2026 strategy. Could you tell us more about actions that the Ministry of Economy will take uh, focusing on the enhancement of attractiveness of, in, of Kazakhstan, more specifically the tax code? Could you comment and tell us a little bit more about the tax code? Thank you for your question. For Kazakhstan to attract investments is one of the top priorities. The government constantly works on improving the investment climate of the country. Apart from the new concept of the investment policy that has just been adopted for the midterm, now investment agreements can be signed with the government on individualized terms and conditions. Also, the ministry is doing the following work. From this year, the Ackerman Minister's rating will be introduced, which hopefully will incentivize everybody to make sure that taxation is more transparent and straightforward. The new tax code is being reviewed right now. Main approaches have been identified to incentivize businesses tax benefits will focus on receiving real multiplication effect. Also, a complex review is underway to identify um, excessive requirements for businesses. Right now, about 7,000 requirements have already been identified and determined as excessive. They will be cancelled. Also this year, a single complex plan will be developed focusing on entrepreneurship development. As for advantages, uh, Kazakhstan's advantages, apart from the beneficial geographic position of our country and rich mineral resources, as our president pointed out, Kazakhstan is also a peace-loving country that has friendly relations with all countries. I believe that all this taken together will uh, give a positive effect and impact uh, for attracting more investments into the country. And this will also make investors more confident when choosing Kazakhstan as a reliable partner. Thank you for your attention. Deputy Mayor of Almaty, our host of this event, I would like on behalf of all the audience and participants to thank Almaty for, such a, for hosting such, a, such an event. Uh, please, Kolumbek, Kolumbek Abdikarimov. Excuse me, it's Alisher Abdikadirov. Dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to meet you all here in Almaty. And I would like to express my deep gratitude to Eurasian uh, Development Bank. As you may know, Almaty is the cultural, scientific and financial center of the country. Our city forms one-fifth of the country's GDP and more than a quarter of all budget revenues. SMEs, which make about 60% of the city's economy, are the main drivers of its growth. Amadi has the necessary labor and infrastructure resources, making it one of the most investment attractive regions of Kazakhstan. The favorable investment climate in Almaty is also confirmed by a high credit rating. In December of last year, Fitch Ratings affirmed the city of Almaty credit ratings at BBB, triple B. Additionally, 90% uh, of all major banks' headquarters are located in Almaty. Uh, also, as the 111 international organizations, embassies, consulates are also located in our city. 
So our next step and uh, challenges are to attract investments for innov innovative technological development within the framework of sustainable and uh, responsible development while maintaining the green agenda. Uh, last year, foreign direct investments in, Al in the Almaty economy rose uh, almost at 11% and the uh, record of uh, 7.6 billion US dollars. At the same time, the FDI in the manufacturing industries increased by 3.5 times, 3.4 times, sorry. And hotel services and uh, food services rose by 2.5 times. We believe that the future lies in the field of high technology in the city of Almaty. Uh, we prior sectors such as uh, automotive industry, electrical equipment production, pharmaceuticals, and medical uh, equipment manufacturing. We believe that these industries have the high potential. Uh, Large-scale industrial projects are being developed uh, in our industrial zone, as well as at the special economic zone of the Park of Innovative Technologies. Uh, at the moment, we're working on uh, expanding uh, the industrial zone by 200 more hectares because we see very high demand from the investors. Uh, beside manufacturing industry, uh, we see that the city have a great potential in, in uh, becoming a creative industries and IT hub. Uh, at the moment, more than 90,000 companies have already been working in uh, creative industries within the city. More than 40% of all IT companies uh, of the country are based in Almaty also. <coughs> the new Museum of Modern Art is uh, under construction. Uh, smart city and other digital capabilities are being actively implemented. Uh, this year, as it was already announced, the Venture Fund will be established to support the creative industries on a parity basis and the initial capitalization would be at about 20-22 million US dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. As you may already witness, Almaty has a unique natural beauty and diversity, rich historical and cultural heritage, attracting domestic and international tourists. The main advantage of the city in terms of developing tourist potential is the location of the city and the airport especially in 20, 20 minute accessibility to the mountain cluster. We have set uh, a plan uh, to develop tourism uh, next year uh, the new the expansion of Almaty International Airport will be finished. So it would double its capacity to up to 14 million passengers a year. New concert hall also will be built. Existing resorts will be reconstructed and expanded. We also have set ourselves the ambitious goal of becoming a global city and entering the top 10, top, uh, top 100 cities in terms of quality of life. So we would like to invite everyone to make its own uh, step in developing the Almaty. Thank you. I wish you all a fruitful work and further cooperation. Thanks. Thank you, Alisher. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, industrial, Almaty industrial zone, its, its expansion. What exact preferences could uh, possible investors get uh, when they uh, come to the zone? We provide land for free, as my colleagues already explained. There are also some custom tax uh, benefits and uh, exclusions. Besides this, uh, what 
we are working on now is to make the infrastructure and all the utilities um, uh, as well as the railroad, as the roads and everything else to be tailored for the particular investor. So because this, uh, it cuts the capex and investment amount. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, our next speaker is Marat Yelibayev, Deputy Chairman, Development Bank of Kazakhstan. Thank you, Amvar Vilimulayevich. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I would like to apologize. My, uh, my speech was prepared in Russian, but I will try to speak in English. Извиняюсь, а можно пульт управления, пожалуйста? Пульт можно? Uh, Development Bank of Kazakhstan uh, is a state uh, development institution which focus on uh, development of large-scale infrastructure and industrial uh, projects. The bank was founded uh, back in 2001 and since then uh, the bank financed 160 investment projects with a total uh, financing amount of 7.8 trillion tenge, which is roughly around 17 billion US dollars. The mission of the bank is to support the development, uh, sustainable development of the national economy through financing of uh, investing uh, non-resource projects. Uh, the current portfolio of the bank is roughly 2 trillion tenge, and key sectors are uh, metallurgy, 25%, uh, oil chemistry, 23%, mining, 60%, electricity, 8%, including green energy, transport logistics, 7%, machinery, 7%, and tourism sector, 5%. Uh, Development Bank of Kazakhstan is part of uh, uh, Baitirek Holding, which is 100% uh, owned by the government. The, the key mandate of Baitirek Holding is to support the development of businesses and attract financing to the country. Apart from DBK, uh, there are a few other subsidiaries of Baitiria Holding, including uh, uh, Kazakhstan Investment Corporation, which focuses on equity investments, uh, Kazakh Export, which provides insurance of export operations. There is also Damu Fund, which focuses on support SME business. Uh, there is also Otpasi Bank, KJK, support mortgage operations. Uh, there is the entity Agrarian Credit Corporation, which focuses on the development of agrarian sector. Uh, in terms of financial results of Development Bank of Kazakhstan, uh, the total assets is roughly 3.9 trillion tenge, which is roughly 8.6 billion US dollars. The capital of the bank around 600 billion tenge. And uh, last year, the bank financed 30 investment and export uh, operations projects in, in the country. In terms of, uh, I will later stop on some of the examples uh, of projects financed by the bank. Uh, in terms of credit rating profile, the, the bank has uh, ratings from uh, Moody's, uh, Fitch, and S&P in line with the sovereign rating of the country and uh, the bank plays an important role in the implementation of state uh, program including infrastructure development uh, program state state industrialization program etc i would like to note that uh, the bank is also quite active attracting not only state funding but also uh, uh, is uh, quite active in attracting uh, financing from the international markets for example last year the bank attracted around 1. 2 billion uh, USD financing from international markets. Uh, 
In terms of uh, some of examples uh, of projects financed by the bank, uh, I would like to stop a bit more here. Uh, in terms of uh, transport logistics, the bank financed expansion of Aktau seaport, modernization of airports in Aktau and in Astana, uh, and one of the examples with YDA, uh, we developed uh, this uh, 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 airport in Aktau. We are now looking to expansion and development of second stage of this uh, port in Aktau city. Uh, some example in a gas infrastructure. Uh, together with Eurasian Development Bank, uh, we financed uh, Sararka gas pipeline connecting north part of the, city, of the country with the south part. Uh, some of uh, landmark projects financed or oh, uh, or approved by the bank is Almaty CHP, uh, conversion from coal to gas project. Uh, uh, some examples uh, with uh, EBRD, uh, we financed modernization and expansion of uh, uh, electricity transmission lines of Kigok uh, through green bond financing. Uh, in terms of renewables, I would like to know that uh, the bank financed nine renewable energy projects in Kazakhstan, including solar, wind, and small hydro. Some of uh, projects uh, uh, we financed, uh, developed by Universal Energy, uh, together with Oraz Aliyevich, uh, uh, project financed in, uh, in wind and solar and hydro. I would like to know that uh, 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 almost one-fourth of electricity generated, renewable energy generated in Kazakhstan, financed by Development Bank of Kazakhstan. Total uh, capacity of finance project, uh, 560 megawatt. And uh, we, we would like to expand uh, our operations in renewable energy going forward. In terms of... Uh, uh, another sector which we think uh, quite important for the country, this is a relatively new sector for the country, but it's, it's important, it's tourism sector. So far the bank financed five projects, including uh, landmark projects such as uh, uh, development of tourism, re touristic region in Aktau region, uh, in, in Astana region, uh, some examples in, uh, uh, in uh, hotels in uh, Borovoye, and Astana cities. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, industry projects, uh, the, the bank is quite active financing industrial project. In our portfolio, we have 42 industrial projects. Roughly, it accounts for 40% of our portfolio. Some, uh, example, some examples uh, of our uh, projects is uh, uh, from Mash Complex, this is the first uh, project uh, production of rail wheels in Kazakhstan in the amount of 300,000 uh, per year. Uh, there is also a landmark project, it's uh, development of car manufacturing uh, with uh, uh, Astana Motors Group. Back in 2019, we financed the first project, production of 45,000 uh, cars in uh, Almaty region, and now uh, last week we approved an expansion of this project, um, uh, financing of uh, 9, 90,000 cars uh, planned uh, to be developed by Astana Motors Group. I would like to know that uh, ESG agenda is uh, is important uh, for the bank. Uh, the first uh, the sustainable development plan was developed back in 2019, and now uh, together with, uh, with the support of Asian Development Bank, now we are developing ESG roadmap, uh, and we would like to incorporate uh, all ESG principles in our, uh, uh, in our activities going forward. In terms of uh, uh, financing terms, as I said, uh, we are quite active in uh, corporate financing as well as project financing. Uh, through our uh, subsidiary industrial development fund, we provide financial leasing, and also we provide guarantees and uh, expert 
trade financing. Uh, we are happy and we are keen to co-finance and to syndicate deals together with other financial institutions in, in the country. Thank you for attention. I'm happy to answer to any questions. Thank you, Marat. Uh, I have such question. What cross-border projects does the bank have in its portfolio? Or maybe not only completed, but maybe you started financing such projects with the foreign participation? Uh, some of uh, example uh, of uh, the project we, find we are looking at the moment in our pipeline is uh, uh, production of caustic soda with Ildirim Group. It's, uh, it's a large-scale uh, plant with 500,000 tons of caustic soda development. Another transaction what we are looking uh, also is uh, development of uh, uh, gas power plant with uh, uh, AXA Energy. So this is a kind of examples uh, what, uh, uh, what we are kind of projects we are working on. Some of the examples, uh, as I mentioned, uh, these touristic projects in Aktau region, in, Karav uh, in Turkestan region, developed by uh, Turkish developer FTG. So this is kind of examples what we are doing in the country. Not mentioning the, your uh, Danish partner who is present at this panel and who will elaborate later on the, <laughs> on the project. Thank yeah, you. I, I would like to, 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 to leave an uh, opportunity to speak uh, uh, colleagues from the uh, Danish uh, Expert Import, uh, Investment Fund to speak about the project we developed together with, with them. Uh, this is another landmark project uh, we developed together with them. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Ruslan Dalenov, Deputy Chairman of Eurasian Development Bank one of the organizers of this event. Thank you very much, uh, dear participants, dear colleagues. I'm pleased to welcome you, all of you here. Uh, um, yes. Yes, uh, here are some figures and brief information about the bank's activities. 17 years of stable growth and investments in sustainable development, 276 successful national development projects, 14 billions, billion dollars accumulated volume of investments, seven billion dollars authorized capital of the EDB, and about uh, five billion dollars current investment uh, portfolio. Uh, over the years of its activity, the bank has implemented uh, 103 projects in the Republic of uh, Kazakhstan. The accumulated uh, investment portfolio amount, uh, amounts to $5 billion. The uh, industrial structure um, is as follows. Uh, industry, energy um, uh, sector, financial sector, transport, uh, other sectors. I would like to dwell on major projects from the bank's portfolio that are currently uh, under development in the territory of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Uh, funded projects, uh, done projects. Uh, Big Almaty Ring Road is one of the major projects uh, financed by the bank. Uh, the bank's participation is uh, $134 million. Uh, the next project is the construction, operation, and management of the international airport in the city of Turkestan. The bank's uh, participation is uh, $130 million. Uh, extension and modernization of Almaty International Airport, the bank's participation is $40 million. Uh, in addition to the projects that are already um, up and running, I would like to tell you about a project uh, in progress. This major project is the construction of the Yayagos Bakhti Railway 
270 kilometers, and the third railway port uh, in, on the border between Kazakhstan and China. Uh, community projects. Uh, I would like also um, uh, to dwell on the projects that have a great effect on the community and improve people's lives. These projects are presented in this uh, slide. Implemented projects, construction of the Sararka gas pipeline, project implemented, uh, implementation effects, providing the population on northern Kazakhstan uh, with access to natural gas from the oil uh, and gas fields in the west of Kazakhstan. Projects, projects um, in development, uh, reconstruction, uh, extension of the Astrakhan Mangistau water supply line, project implementation effects, uh, providing the population of Western Kazakhstan with the required amount of fresh water. Construction of a multi specialty hospital in Kokshitau, project uh, implementation effects, ensuring the uh, availability of medical services to 80% of the population of the region. Uh, ADB is G projects. The bank pays great attention to the implementation of projects that focus on reducing gas emissions and improving the environment. Uh, here are some of them. Implemented projects, um, construction, uh, uh, plants and wind farms, the bank's uh, participation is $300 million, the construction of 10 solar power plants in a number of regions of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Almaty, Turkestan, Jambul regions, etc., uh, was financed. Uh, projects in development, uh, reconstruction uh, of Almaty heat and power um, plant number three, with an increase in the plant's capacity of 500 megawatts. Uh, one of the bank's priorities is the implementation of key investment mega projects. Uh, the bank strategy makes it possible to structure and launch the financing of investment projects in the following areas. Uh, Eurasian transport framework, uh, uh, the bank and pays great attention uh, to the development of transport infrastructure, including the construction and modernization of railway and tracks and highways. The water and, uh, energy complex, uh, the bank actively participates in the construction and modernization of heat and hydroelectric uh, power plants. We help develop green energy and restore the reclamation system of the region. Another globally important issue is food security. For the Eurasian region, the bank promotes food security through the implementation of a large-scale project, the Eurasian Commodity Distribution Network. Uh, expected implementation effects. 1.5% annual additional GDP growth in the countries of Central Asian region, 1.5 percentage points uh, increase in employment uh, rate, 2 percentage points growth uh, of the share of trade in food products in the mutual trade of the member countries, a 30% increase in cargo turnover of the member countries. What are the advantages of working with EDB? The bank's financing can be done in the senior debt format. It can provide grace periods. Besides, the bank can purchase issued bonds, etc. How can uh, the bank is able to finance projects, provide technical assistance, organize a dialogue on the cross-border projects at the high level? Uh, provide information and analytical, analytical support. Uh, technical assistance is a very important tool that is widely used to international, by international organizations and development banks as uh, a catalyst for development projects. Um, uh, today, the Technical, technical Assistance Fund uh, has implemented uh, 
90 technical assistance projects, uh, 1.3 billion dollars potential value of uh, fund assisted investment project. Uh, the bank follows its own established uh, procedures uh, for um, projects. Uh, they are transparent and meet high standards at all stages. The, uh, according to the bank's strategy and uh, the country strategy for, for the Republic of Kazakhstan, uh, the new investment plan for the period up to 2026 uh, is uh, $3.8 billion. In the Republic of Kazakhstan, the annual volume of investment amounted to $1.2 billion. Uh, the growth of new investments uh, increased by five times uh, compared to 2021. In uh, 2023, the bank plans to make $1.1 billion of new investments in the economy of the Republic of Kazakhstan. That is more, that is more than half of the bank's new investment will go to Kazakhstan. In, in total, the amount of potential projects under consideration by the bank in 2023 exceeds $2.5 billion and total amount uh, of investments uh, will be about seven billion dollars. Uh, in the new strategic period of 2020-26, the EDB will pay emphasis uh, will, will, will lay emphasis on strengthening its unique role. Uh, over the next five years, the EDB will invest in the Republic of Kazakhstan as much as. It, uh, as it has done over the last 15 years. Uh, all in all, more than $10 billion uh, will be spent on the development of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruslan. And I would like to ask you uh, the next question. Central banks all over the world are tightening their monetary policies, which has an immediate effect on the cost of funding. So a straightforward question to Eurasian Development Bank. Are you raising your rates? How are you reacting to that situation? Well, regarding funding, I agree that it has become um, more expensive uh, over the past year. I would even uh, say uh, significantly more expensive, tremendously even. Uh, we are witnessing a global trend of uh, expensive borrowing. That's true. Uh, here we have several ways to alleviate this situation. Uh, for example, in Kazakhstan, the base rate is at uh, record high, but everyone uh, understands that uh, uh, it should be decreased, um, but uh, it, it will eventually, but uh, the question is when. Uh, so uh, the best strategy for borrower uh, would be a floating rate. Uh, if uh, when uh, base rate decreases, uh, so will the loan uh, servicing costs. Uh, alternatively, um, in the Central Asian countries, uh, Central Asian countries have uh, specific funding programs, programs, uh, subsidy programs that can reduce uh, interest rate uh, of the um, uh, agreements uh, of credits. Uh, and uh, finally, if projects is uh, important, the EDB uh, can use. Uh, um, uh, cross subsidies. Uh, while a particular project uh, may not yield uh, high returns, uh, we, um, the bank has other profitable um, projects that uh, can make it uh, financially um, uh, viable. Uh, we are a development bank in the end, so uh, we have a technical assistance fund we can uh, use uh, it for, uh, to finance uh, certain expenses of borrower 
for example, uh, insurance that uh, uh, reduce uh, that will reduce uh, the cost of um, uh, lo loan uh, servicing costs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would like to give floor to Jens Hesberg, uh, Denmark's export credit agency. Please. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, panel. It's a great honor to, to be here. Uh, and thank you for giving me the time just to introduce you a little bit to uh, IFO, which is uh, the export credit agency of uh, Denmark. Um, we have been around for a while. We have a history of uh, more than 100 years in this uh, business. Um, and all the time we have been owned and guaranteed by the Danish state, uh, which is very favorable for us because that leaves us with a AAA rating. And of course, that makes us quite attractive to include in any transaction uh, we do. We are set up our, uh, with our own independent board. Um, so we operate and take our own decisions within the sphere of uh, IFO. So it's either with the board or with the credit committee internally of uh, IFO. Uh, we operate on commercial terms um, in every transaction that uh, we participate in. And we like to work together with the uh, Development Bank of Kazakhstan and of course everybody more or less here in the room. Uh, we like to team up with other partners with local uh, presence or with knowledge within this uh, specific business that we uh, do business in. Uh, we are headquartered in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark uh, and we have two outlets, uh, one in New York and one in uh, Singapore and every around 500 uh, people working there serving uh, more than 5,000 clients. And the portfolio is around uh, yeah, a little less than 20 billion uh, euro. We are, of course, a mirror of uh, the Danish uh, industry. So uh, I'm very pleased to see that here also on the screen have a turning uh, wind turbine. We are very big in uh, the windmill industry uh, in Denmark, but we are also quite uh, big in mining, cement, um, yeah, agriculture, uh, power to X, uh, and, and lots of other businesses, uh, infrastructure, for instance. Uh, we do a lot of uh, construction work and railroads, for instance, uh, in Africa, and have also done that in, uh, in Asia. Uh, we are here with a mandate to make it attractive for everybody to uh, purchase equipment from uh, Danish uh, companies. Uh, and we have a mandate to uh, step in where there's a lack of capacity from commercial banks. And we are also willing to uh, take a risk that, uh, that the commercial banks are not necessarily uh, willing to take. Um, we usually provide guarantees. I can come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, so we usually guarantee banks that do the financing, like the transaction we did with the Development Bank of Kazakhstan last year. And uh, we are a truly global institution. Um, at the moment, we have the highest exposure in Europe, but that's mainly because we have done uh, some substantial transactions uh, within the windmill uh, sector. So as you can see, we are maybe the greenest ECA in the world uh, with a very high focus on ESG as well. 72% of our portfolio is uh, related directly to the windmill, uh, the wind turbine industry. Of course, that's because we have the two of the world's leading uh, windmill producers uh, in Denmark, being uh, Vestas and Siemens Gamesa and uh, all the suppliers to that industry. Um, but as you can see, we're also quite big on railways, uh, cement, and uh, especially mining is picking up uh, big time uh, this, um, this year's. And mining is uh, quite interesting uh, for us uh, uh, also because, uh, as you can see, we are very big in the windmill industry, but we also acknowledge uh, what a windmill is actually made of. Uh, and with the industries we have in Denmark, we have a, a great opportunity to be the one-stop shop for financing of the green transition. So we would like to, to do the whole value chain of the green transition. So we want to be involved in extraction of raw materials. We will continue to do cement financing uh, and of course also continue to do uh, wind turbines as we are quite good at. 
we actually financed uh, one third of the global uh, offshore windmills, uh, ex China though, but uh, it's a substantial amount of windmills. I think we financed something like uh, 34 gigawatt uh, of wind power globally. So of course we will continue to do windmills, um, but we want to take this to uh, level two, so to say. So. Uh, financing also uh, some of the uses of all this nice green electricity that we uh, can make out of these nice uh, windmills. So we have a lot of activities also within Power2x uh, and alternative fuels, um, which we think also will pick up uh, heavily the years to come. Uh, and in Denmark being one of the world's leading uh, shipping um, uh, countries also, there's also a great potential that all this nice fuel can be used for, for instance, the shipping industry, uh, but also aviation and land transport. So our intention is to be a one-stop shop uh, for financing of the green transition. Um, our general principles for what we do is that we follow the OECD arrangement uh, for export credit agencies. Uh, I guess more or less uh, many of you are familiar with those uh, guidelines, but uh, they outline what we can do on, uh, on the structure of the transaction, the repayment terms, the pricing, uh, and so forth. And also, as I said in the beginning, as a general principle, we would like to share the risk with somebody else, somebody who knows the local market. Uh, and we want to be part of Su and Parasa with all the senior lenders and, and we also participate uh, as a senior lender. And I guess uh, the theme of today more or less has been the environment and the green transition. So being state owned and be the greenest, uh, being the greenest ECA in the world, of course, ESG is very high on our agenda and is very high on the government's agenda as well. So uh, the IFC performance standards is key for us to participate in uh, a transaction uh, we do. On top of, of course, reputation risks uh, and, and other important uh, matters. Um, and as I said, when we participate in a transaction, it's our own decision, it's, it's a commercial-based uh, decision we make. So. The, the usual way we do a, a transaction is that we provide a guarantee to a bank that provides a loan to a project and then finances uh, a Danish uh, exporters. And it's very important to say here also that the Danish exporter does not have to produce the equipment supplied in Denmark. It can be sourced uh, globally um, as long as it's with a Danish-owned uh, company that the contract is made. Um, yeah. So, we are very happy to have concluded our first uh, transaction here locally in uh, Kazakhstan. It was a landmark transaction for us. It was a bit complicated, but uh, that was not due to Kazakhstan, that was uh, due to the pandemic. But uh, we managed, uh, and a uh, big thank to uh, Development Bank of Kazakhstan for really taking the lead in uh, structuring this uh, transaction. So. The concept of this transaction was that the uh, cash minerals, uh, they want to expand their Arctogai uh, mining complex. And uh, most of that expansion, you know better than me, was financed by Development Bank of Kazakhstan. And because there was a quite big uh, equipment supply from uh, yeah, one of the world leading uh, equipment suppliers to the mining industry, F.L. Smith, uh, they had a contract of around $100 million. We were able to provide quite a substantial loan to this uh, structure. So um, we also include uh, a few deliveries from uh, ABB in Switzerland. So we ended up with a loan of 120 million US. Um, and the structure was that um, Cash Loans, they borrowed the money in Development Bank of Kazakhstan and they turned to JP Morgan uh, on the back of a guarantee from us. Uh, and. Uh, I, I think that we provide a quite a, a attractive financing all in for the funding of uh, Development Bank of Kazakhstan here. The tricky part was of course that in a structure like this we still need to have the ESD requirements included in, uh, in the various loan agreements here because that's so important for us. But uh, at the end of the day uh, we managed uh, despite uh, COVID-19 uh, again, it was due to a professional, very professional approach from Development Bank of Kazakhstan, but of course also professional parties like uh, the end user Cash Minerals, uh, the equipment supplier F.L. Smith, and of course also JP Morgan being our agent in this uh, facility. 
Uh, and I think that it was very important for us that also uh, Development Bank of Kazakhstan, early in the process, uh, committed to, uh, to perform the ESG uh, work to be done here. So we have appetite for more. We would like to do more transactions together with the uh, Development Bank of uh, Kazakhstan. We want to do more mining, but we could also uh, participate in uh, infrastructure projects, uh, wind turbines, uh, and so forth. Thank you, Jens. It was a nice description how classical ECA with the crown and its logo adapted to new challenges in the new world. My question is, do you have concrete plans about potential future deals in Kazakhstan or it just uh, general? I think it's more a matter of uh, the Kazakhstan companies uh, acquiring equipment from uh, Danish uh, suppliers. So um, whenever there is a Danish contract, we are, as a rule of thumb, uh, interested in the transaction. So yeah, we definitely hope to do more in this region, but also your neighboring countries. Um, and if there's a flavor of green transition and something we can do nicely for the environment, reduce CO2 emissions, uh, it's definitely a great advantage. And for us, for instance, mining is also uh, something that uh, is important for the green transition. So yeah, we're very happy to, to be here, to meet all your interesting people and uh, to continue our support to the country. Thank you. I would like to invite our next speaker, Galenbek Mamraev, CEO, YDA Holding. Thank you and uh, good day, welcome. Before starting the video, one small remark, I'm not the CEO of YDA, but I'm the head of all the PPP practice here in the region also. Uh, and so, uh, there will be a short video uh, about what we do, uh, what we have achieved and the plans uh, to do here in Kazakhstan. First of all, uh, thanks to EDB for inviting us to be present here. We're really happy to work with this uh, marvelous institution. And uh, I'm really honored to be here with all the uh, colleagues, speakers. Uh, so could you please start the video? YDA Group has nearly 50 years of experience and a total of 17 billion of projects both completed and ongoing and uh, now it's 17,000 17, employees as when I just joined it was less than that and we doubled the international country experience. Certainly the main expertise are construction, so it's EPC construction and uh, general construction and contracting but also have strong presence in defense, aviation, healthcare, uh, in supporting services and in IT. So what you see is uh, in examples of uh, the residential developments and what we do as an EPC contractor for sure in the roads sectors. Uh, but not to stop here, and that's where the company started actually. Then we moved to aviation and there are airports in Dalaman Airport in Turkey and the PPP mode. And what's more important, uh, in Kazakhstan, we have Akhtau Airport in concession, ongoing, one of the very first concession PPP contracts in Kazakhstan. And certainly the record-breaking 11 months uh, construction project in Turkestan, the airport, supported by the Eurasian Development Bank. Uh, in the healthcare, uh, also, YD Group was a, like a past breaking doing the very first PPP deals in Turkey. Now, in Konya, in Manisa, in Kayseri hospitals, which are very big and complex structures. Now, we're trying to bring that experience to Kazakhstan, uh, the international standards, uh, and to increase the availability of infrastructure so that doctors will only provide quality medical services, they don't need to be distracted to anything else. Now we're uh, developing projects in Turkestan, which is in the south, a very populated area, in Petropavlovsk in the north, and in Astana, which is a, also a unique project because it's a medical university, which makes it really complex to uh, make it happen, all by PPP mode. And certainly in order to 
make this project happen and make some innovations. Where the key data uh, company of YD Group is employing all the best of IT technologies. So the data centers, the software, including medical information systems, laboratory systems, are all sourced in-house. Uh, we now have plans to go into the defense sector here in Kazakhstan to help strengthen the defense potential. Though we know we, yes, we are a peaceful country, but we need to be prepared. And so that's, there are plans in Turkestan expand further uh, to do an additional development in Ektao as an air base, an air force base, and have a hospital there, a designated military hospital for these purposes. And certainly we don't just do contracting EPC contracts or uh, PPP, but also we do our own investments. And that's an example. In Astana, there are five factories uh, funded by the YD group itself. Uh, they produce patient bedhead units, the, all this uh, needed for the hospitals, the, even the gas outlets, sockets, everything that's needed in the hospital. And medical furniture, which is very important so that we make our, uh, how to say, uh, contribution to the diversification of economy. The office furniture, yeah, well, that's uh, maybe more or less of a usual story and uh, prefabricated buildings. So for all the customers and clients here in Kazakhstan uh, who would be doing mining projects uh, or doing other projects in field uh, and on-site and off-site, we can support in that. And we have some plans right now we're discussing with the Ministry of uh, Industry and Development for the participation in metals and mining and we're closely looking for the energy specifically the renewable energy sector uh, because we see that uh, institutional framework and legislation in the whole environment is really supportive and favorable to investors. Uh, agriculture, well that's right now is more of a local uh, story in Turkey uh, but let's see how it goes. Well, uh, we hope also we can bring the experience expanded here in Kazakhstan because the country has uh, great potential and we all know that for sure. Uh, and support services because uh, we have this expertise in uh, public private partnerships and it's not just construction but you need also to operate and in order to provide uh, world class services we have set up a few companies that are aimed only at providing the services like rehabilitation, like laboratory services, like uh, building management services, IT infrastructure, laundry you can see, uh, that's a building management service, anything from ground to top and within the hospital is fully provided uh, by the in-house expertise. Uh, so this is a short presentation but let me add a few more. Uh, and this would all not be possible uh, without our commitment for the local contracting. So we strongly believe that doing projects in any country requires hiring and developing local workforce. That's why more than 90%, well, almost close to 100% in all of our projects is local. Local engineers, local uh, back office, local project managers, local leaders, and that's very crucial for successful development. Uh, and as you can see on the example of uh, factories, uh, we just don't rely on EPC contracts, we don't rely on something government backed. But we also would we love to create opportunities to develop the sectors. And uh, as it was mentioned, yes, we are planning to expand Achtau Airport because it has a really great potential and we hope to do more projects for the benefit of uh, this country. Uh, hopefully also in this lovely city of Almaty, one day there will be an opportunity. Uh, and yeah, so that's, that's the story and I would like to also add because there was a mention that local commercial banks are not participating a lot. Yes, this is true and we really need to rely on all the project finance needs on the development banking institutions because you know the Basel is pressing hard on commercial banks. Uh, and that's very normal, as I understand. Uh, so we would uh, love to see the future developments. Uh, certainly, as this has been mentioned, we are very eager and very 
waiting for the interest rates to go down to finally do the local uh, 10 year financing because we believe that's the that's very correct story to finance all the projects in your country in the local currency. That's how you also support the overall finance infrastructure, including. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer all the questions. Thank you, Golenbeck. Uh, could you share some details about your PPP experience with the Eurasian Development Bank? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, well, we, uh, we have this uh, experience in Turkestan International Airport, and actually uh, there was an agreement in 2020. We signed the loan agreement, uh, and it was very, really quick experience, so we were really quick and efficient, and that's totally a uh, contribution of the bank. Uh, we actually, well, well, we can say, I guess we can say that, we already fully repaid the loan, so the loan is fully repaid, now we continue operation of the airport, and it's a very successful story. Now we want to build up from this to future sectors. Uh, as we have seen, uh, EDB is already investing in hotels, or oh, sorry, in hospitals, and uh, these are PPP hospitals, and we would like to be also the part of the story. That's why we're developing these three hospitals in Kazakhstan uh, on a PPP mode, and hopefully uh, we can do most of them this year. This will be great. Uh, as for PPP, I, I could specifically point out that the bank team, local bank team, has really very deep understanding of project finance, so we have haven't had any problem. The only problem was we were trying to make it faster. But in terms of expertise, in terms of uh, all other procedures, it was just brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very encouraging. <laughs> Our last but not the least speaker is Oras Jandosov, the prominent uh, civil servant turned Renewable energy man. <laughs> so please, Rosalich, your experience. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Anwar. I try to be short as we already deep into lunch time. The, uh, our company, Universal Energy uh, Kazakhstan, is a joint venture between Universal Energy, which is a private uh, Shanghai based. Uh, uh, specialized company specialized in renewable energy uh, and uh, up to today as I think we are the biggest uh, renewable energy producer in Kazakhstan we have uh, commissioned and operating uh, around uh, 400 uh, uh, megawatts of uh, both solar and uh, wind uh, power plants uh, uh, and uh, in the end of the last year, Ministry of Energy, yeah, uh, sure, just a few words. Uh, uh, Kazakhstan is, uh, ha has developed over the years uh, quite uh, efficient system of uh, feeding tariffs for renewable energy, uh, uh, which, which are distributed mostly uh, through the auction uh, systems. And this auction system works uh, rather well allowing to to, uh, to to create real real uh, competition <clears throat> a real uh, level playing field uh, and so so the uh, in the in the late latest uh, auction for wind energy uh, our company actually won with the lowest bid which was roughly 2.7 uh, U.S. Uh, cents per uh, megawatt hour for wind energy, uh, and this, this uh, good good news is that this, this system, according to our dialogues through uh, Renewable SSA, uh, Energy Association Casa Green, uh, our dialogue with the Ministry of Energy uh, from uh, this year on, uh, the, the Ministry will establish medium-term program for auctions which which is very helpful for potential all potential investors uh, because 
until last year, actually, the volume of uh, renewable energy to be auctioned was announced only uh, for one year, per one year, it, and it was quite difficult for planning in terms of uh, land acquisition, meaning, meaning leasing, uh, fin financial uh, package preparation, and also the uh, conducting tenders for, for producers. And uh, Jens, by the way, we conduct uh, all our tenders through competitive bidding. Uh, sorry that both Vestas and Simis <laughs> Gamisa didn't win. Yeah, hopefully in the future they may. The, uh, so the, uh, and from the very beginning we have had very good uh, uh, relationships with Development Bank because uh, renewable energy obviously requires quite long period uh, for capital to, to, to be recovered. Uh, so so uh, in uh, 2018 and 19, when we started, we have simultaneously two, two, uh, two, two loans uh, being prepared, one with a BRD, and Marat at that time was in a BRD, <laughs> and uh, with DBK, with Development Bank of Kazakhstan, for 100 megawatt solar plant. Uh, which we finally built also within a one year, which was quite a short period for 100 megawatt uh, project. Uh, and uh, this were both uh, project finance, uh, and if for EBRD, uh, how say, it was more, much more experienced institution, obviously. Uh, for DBK, it was uh, for renewables uh, first, yeah, project finance uh, based uh, project. And uh, we had had quite uh, long and productive uh, house, uh, negotiations, uh, but finally we were, develop, uh, we were able to develop this good financing project. And why I'm uh, trying, uh, talking in more details, because uh, this uh, project with 100 megawatt solar plant in Kapshagai uh, city, which is, uh, by the way, li largest solar power plant in uh, Kazakhstan in terms of production annual production. The, uh, we, since then, we were able to uh, refinance this project uh, with one of uh, Kazakhstan commercial banks. Uh, no, uh, uh, the, uh, and, and, and receive uh, eight-year uh, tenor loan. So, and basically it shows uh, the, the, how, how development, development banks are working, uh, should, should, should work, should try to help and work in Kazakhstan what Gallenbeck also mentioned. The, uh, obviously, taking bigger risk at uh, uh, designing and construction and commissioning phase uh, is better done by uh, development banks. Uh, but later on, after, after project is commissioned and operates more or less according to the uh, business plan, uh, it's much more easier to refinance them uh, with, um, uh, Kazakhstan com commercial banks. No, of course, I do not mention here the uh, uh, high interest rates and, and other uh, government support measures, which are quite developed and already mentioned by my colleagues at today's uh, session. We are very grateful always to Committee of Investment, which are very supportive, uh, both with, uh, with uh, so-called in <laughs> investment contract, yeah? <laughs> but also with the overall uh, uh, general support, which maybe sometimes is not that uh, strictly defined, but quite important uh, for us. Uh, there are also several other uh, systems of government support, which uh, I guess we mentioned already through DAMU uh, fund, uh, and through, through, through other supports. The, also, one of course, thing to mention is that the regional authorities, uh, we, our plants are in four different cities, uh, uh, established in four different regions of Kazakhstan, and uh, uh, we, uh, normally we have quite uh, uh, good welcome and support for, for, for all projects on, the, on behalf of the local governments. No, that's all to save time. Thank you. Uh, 
I think as a moderator, I have the right to ask one, one question. I'm sorry, I forgot yeah, to mention. And uh, yeah, we, we won uh, 250 megawatts uh, more in this uh, last year auctions and are now developing in early stage of developing them. But also, of course, as was already also mentioned, uh, we, we are thinking about uh, localization. And uh, during this, uh, this week meetings in uh, Xi'an, uh, China, uh, the, uh, the chair of our com uh, company uh, will try to, 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 uh, to formally uh, provide our proposals, but uh, we, we are thinking uh, both about localization of uh, existing uh, wind turbine uh, uh, equipment, no, st starting uh, with easier parts parts of it, uh, but also uh, you know the, the Kazakhstan is uh, quite coal reliant country in terms of electricity generation and the challenges of moving uh, to more green grid. Uh, are quite substantial and uh, obviously we need much more storage electricity storage system and this we think is a very prospective uh, point especially uh, I mean as was also mentioned uh, Kazakhstan have a lot of minerals uh, in uh, under our ground uh, so uh, potentially we may develop uh, the whole value chain uh, for storage uh, equipment here in Kazakhstan and this uh, these are things to be definitely to be localized in Kazakhstan and we are working on, on this thank you thank you so my question is uh, uh, there are uh, general me uh, measures of state support for investment projects but sometimes uh, 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 the state institutions or quasi state institutions could tailor made individual preferences, measures to particular client. What should be the balance of these uh, measures? Or uh, what is the balance and what it should be, in your view? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, as was uh, already uh, mentioned during our ses session here, the, uh, I mean, this uh, system of uh, uh, general or standard uh, measures is, is quite uh, developed in Kazakhstan. And uh, of course, the, the, there are things to be improved, but and these uh, things are gradually being done, uh, as was reported also. The concerning uh, individual approach, uh, individual support, no, of course, there is a, uh, sometimes, how to say, a little bit uh, uh, difficult thing uh, maybe to, to ask for more individual uh, support than, than others. Uh, uh, so, so I think uh, in, individual support uh, probably is, uh, is more needed when there are some uh, problems emerge. Uh, when some, some problems may emerge uh, this or there uh, in, in the implementation of the project. And in this case, I think uh, sometimes uh, was and will be necessary to maybe to to, to request uh, some government authorities or quasi government institutions to come into the situation uh, when things are developing normally i think uh, this standardized system is sufficient mm -hmm. yeah. okay thank you i would like to thank all the participants of this panel thank you the audience for your patience i i hope it was interesting <laughs>